a presentation of Life as a Country Doctor by Dr. John Southwick. It's been my great pleasure to be asked to introduce this gentleman this evening. Dr. Southwick is a native of Champlain and a 1950 graduate of Champlain High School. He's a 1951 graduate of Shadyside Academy Prep School and he graduated from Yale University in 1955. He attended and graduated New York Medical College and graduated in 1959. He served his internship at Waterbury Hospital in Connecticut and also served in the United States Army as a uh, surgeon and dispensary commander from 1960 to 1962 in Germany. When he returned to the United States, he completed his residency at Waterbury Hospital in Connecticut from 1962 to 63 and returned to Champlain in 1963 to become a physician at North Country Medical Center. In April 2004, Dr. Southwick retired from active practice. For over 40 years, this gentleman provided health care to a large majority of the residents of Northern Clinton County, and in most cases, his care spanned the generations of two to three levels. He has lived through the era of house calls and $5 office visits to computerization and electronic medical records. He has attended many births and deaths of patients, provided emergency care in the office as well as in the field, and is seen as a community leader within the village of Champlain, within the fire department, the library, for just a couple. As a personal perspective, Dr. Southwick took me under his wing as a nurse practitioner student and as a novice nurse practitioner. He always provided the time and the effort to answer questions when my experience could not answer them, <coughs> as well as the reassurance I desperately needed to continue. And thank you for that. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce to you Dr. John Southwick. Thank you, Lori. And it's uh, really an honor to be here tonight. I can think of at least five other physicians in the area who had at least as much experience as I've had probably could do a better job than what I'm about to try to do. But anyway, uh, with Rich Frost here and Calvin, I thought maybe I'd talk a little bit about my, ex uh, my experiences going to World Series. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll stick to the script. Uh, what I'm going to do tonight is give you a little background including some motivating factors, my education, which Lori has outlined, specific training, my own practice experiences, interspersed with anecdotes. Now, I will be hit or miss with the anecdotes. I'll state them, and sometimes it doesn't seem like it follows any pattern. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, uh, it's happened in the interim since I first started comparing the past with the present. And what a community means to me. And retirement, to include what my family has contributed, and the many good fortunes that I've had throughout my schooling and practice. You will hear the word fortunate many times because I truly have been blessed and fortunate. As Lori said, I graduated from Champlain High School in 1950, and in the May, May of 1950, a scholarship became available uh, that uh, uh, I'm sure Bob knows very well about, Bob Booth. It was the Atwood Scholarship, and it was the first year that it was presented, and it was presented to a graduating senior from Champlain High School was going on to college. There were 19 people in my class. Only one person went on to college. So who got the... Who got the college? <laughs> but that was May. And I wasn't as fortunate as Bob and probably not as smart. I didn't get accepted to Yale the first year. I did get accepted at Syracuse. But I had the fortunate opportunity to live with the Atwoods in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and go to a prep school that their son John got. The reason the Atwoods set up the scholarship was in memory of two sons, the only two children that they had. 
One died, I believe, at age 13 or 14 from, I think, Bright's disease. Glomerular lymphitis, which is an inflammation of the kidneys. And the second son, John, was lost in a submarine during World War II. Two finer people I have never met. They took me into their home, Pittsburgh, and I went to Shadyside Academy for a year and was fortunate to get into Yale after that. At Yale, I was again fortunate to run into a classmate of mine named Moral Solomon. He knew how to study, and I did. So he took me under his wing. He said, uh, you are not going to study in your room. Too many distractions, we're going to the library. And we'd go to the library sometimes from 8 o'clock at night till midnight, spend another two hours studying. I was slow. <laughs> but it got me through until my junior year at Yale when I was confronted with a Yale English professor who thought I knew nothing about poetry. We were 180 degrees difference in inter interpreting poetry. So I got a 50. So I called home and I said to my folks, and they were very understanding. I was very, very fortunate, again, to have supportive family. My mother and father supported me emotionally and financially through all my schooling. I said, uh, well, I don't think there are too many medical schools that are going to accept grades of 50, unless it's 50 out of 50. And they said, well, maybe not. Maybe that's not where you're headed. So I decided to take a course at the University of New Hampshire in Durham, New Hampshire, to make up the English course. And I did. While I was there, I visited an aunt in a small village of Maine. And there, I met my future wife, Heather Fulcher. So, luck of course, meet a wife. <laughs> Uh, and I'll tell you more about her later because she's been my mainstay of support through 50 years of marriage. Uh, I was able to be accepted at New York Medical College to finish my Yale. And I can tell you without any question, if I were to be presented, if I had presented myself in grades to medical school at this stage, I don't think I would have gotten in. You know why I got in? Look at me, I'm a wasp. Yes, and that was the uppermost factor, I'm sure, at least a major factor in why I got into medical school. I did make the best of it, or tried to. Again, in medical school, I was fortunate <coughs> to have a classmate named Mike Stockheim. Mike was a whiz. Uh, he could read a book, read a page, and it was there. I had to struggle along, but he helped me. And we used to study late at night, like I did in college. And I'm sure he was the mainstay in helping me get through medical school. When I graduated from medical school, I still hadn't decided exactly what I wanted to do, but I thought general practice was still the first, my first choice. I like the idea of maybe going into cardiology or pulmonary function study, pulmonary studies. So thinking more in the lines of general practice, I went to Waterbury, Connecticut, to a rotating internship. I said, don't believe there are rotating internships now. What a rotating internship is that you spend a certain amount of time in surgery, a certain amount of time in internal medicine, a certain amount of time in pediatrics, obstetrics, and the subspecialties. <coughs> Neurology, eyes, ears, nose, throat, and an emergency room. After internship, I was obligated to the Army because I had been deferred uh, in college. Back then, there was a Berry plan available, and one could be deferred going into service until schooling was finished. So they, I was allowed to complete my internship, and went into the Army for two years. Uh, we were stationed in Germany, and uh, I, I hesitate to say it, but I will anyway. 
it was kind of a wasted two years, not because I didn't try, but the excitement of standing at attention and getting up at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> not, I, I would do that for a patient, but not to stand at attention. <laughs> so my time in the Army was well spent, except I made some friends. And another fortunate aspect of this was that when I was discharged, the week I was discharged, my unit, an engineer battalion, went to Vietnam. And my company, my battalion commander, asked if I would consider re-enlisting. And I said, no, thank you, and went home. Then I went back to Waterbury. I still wanted to go into family practice, and I was allowed to set up my own schedule of what particular areas of the hospital that I could serve. I wanted to serve more in the obstetrics, emergency room, and certainly on the internal medicine floor. After a year and a half of that, not getting much credit other than the fact that it satisfied what I wanted to do, I went to Champlain, and from 2004, to, uh, I'm sorry, from 1963 to 2004, I was at the North Country Medical Group. We had looked at several other practices before settling in Champlain. My wife said I never was serious about any other place. You were always going to go back to Champlain. I guess she may have been right. The uh, idea of going back to hometown is not always thought to be the best thing to do. There's little Johnny Southwick coming back and I don't know if I can trust him or not. I remember him when he was, I remember him when he was in school and when he was growing up and he was a little bit of a hellraiser. And I said, has he changed? I hope he has. But it worked out fine. Uh, you know, I, I can't tell you enough about, and I'm updating or getting ahead of myself a little bit, like what the community means, what it meant to me. I said many times that when I finished a day in the office that I got more from my patients than they got from me. I learned so much history, not only family history, but area history from my patients. And that to me, uh, and learning about human nature, you know, that's something that maybe physicians forget about when they go into practice. Learn about human nature. You can learn an awful lot by just listening. At first we had a practice full birth to death, except for major surgery. My first office staff, one nurse, one RN, who did all the booking, did the entries, put the patients in the room, did the vital signs, EKGs when they were indicated, laboratory work, and very often we worked from 8 o'clock in the morning till 10 or 11 at night, except on Wednesday afternoon. And Wednesday afternoon, I would uh, stay home. And again, my good wife would say, okay, you can take a nap, I'll answer the phone, and whoever calls, I will say, I won't say you're gone, I'll say you're here, but that I will take the message and have him call you back. And she did that. Saturday afternoon, we finish usually at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock. Sundays after rounds was house calls. And, and these were... Uh, these were not big chores either, making house calls on people that you knew couldn't come to the office. And many times they weren't terribly sick, but they needed attention. And they needed some sort of care that couldn't be given any other way. Back then, when I first started, there were no emergency room doctors. There were no emergency medical technicians. Therefore, I was called to many accidents, and house calls 
were not unusual. The person that you ought to have here talk about house calls was George Clark from Shazy. Oh, yeah. This man has outdone me in many ways as far as house calls, longevity, time and service. But I did a number of house calls. Night calls were there, but almost without exception they were justified. Generally, you'd have maybe one or two in the night. I was able to sleep very well, knowing that I had done what I could do, except on one occasion. And I'll tell you about that a little bit later when I get to some of the case histories. The one or two times when I did get upset with patients was that they'd fall off a bar stool when I got lacerated and I had to go to the office this old one. That did twist my curls a little bit. <laughs> Deliveries, I mentioned, we did in the beginning. In fact, one year, I, I didn't write it down, but I think it was 1965, I delivered the first baby of the new year at CB, at Physician's Hospital, it wasn't CB now. Uh, and had no problem with it. Uh, I never had any problems with deliveries, but we always had good backup. And uh, besides excellent obstetricians, excellent pediatricians, and always people who were willing to help. Our fees, uh, Lori mentioned, five dollars. It was four dollars when they started. Four dollars for an office visit, six dollars for a house call. Didn't make any difference what the office visit was. And back then, all office visits were one problem. Almost all. Patients came in with one problem, and we didn't do. Not altogether didn't do, but we did very little preventive medicine back then. We took care of the problems. Uh, the only preventive medicine we did back then were pap smears and immunizations. We didn't screen for risk factors, cholesterol, uh, routine blood work. In fact, many times we see patients not even take the blood work. Not very often, once in a while. Uh, house calls didn't make any difference how far it was. Always six dollars. The radius from our office was 25 miles west, 20 miles south, occasionally into Canada, and occasionally into Vermont. I did have coverage with Bob Pratt, who was a family practitioner, excellent one, from Alberta. He had many patients on our side of the lake, and he and I got together to cover each other if one of us happened to be away. We had an x-ray machine in our office. We had basic lab work, CBC, complete blood count, blood sugars and urine, basically that was it. We had uh, an EKG, well, not that EKG. Mm -hmm. Casting, did a lot of fracture work. Uh, I got in trouble one time with that too. Well, it came in with a trimalleolar fracture, the ankle, the ankle was the ankle is like this. Those of you that aren't familiar with it, you have bone here, bone here from the leg bone coming down and the tibia. And this would go in here, here, and crack in here. And the ankle is like this. I proceeded to cast it. Six weeks later, the ankle is still like this. So we had a Orthopedist by the name of Fran Baker at the time. Excellent orthopedist. He saved my neck this day and age. I was, he could have been a hawk or my old car would have been all sold. To me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he saved my neck and the patient ended up all right. Other than that, learned a lesson. Other than that, most fractures that I did were simple fractures. But two college fractures, did some reductions, and casted a number of them. Our ambulance, Champlain ambulance at that time was the first. Uh, we had well-meaning first aid 
attendance, who were there to help and were there to learn. I always knew when I was going to get called, because the fire whistle blew back then, no beepers. The fire whistle blew, and if it was a, a long and two beeps, I said, oh, 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to get a call. Sure enough, get a call. Many times we took the patient to the hospital and unfortunately told them the ambulance driver to wait, maybe take him back home in the hearse, bring him down in the hearse as an ambulance and back to the hearse in the hearse. But we did our best and very often, I think, helped a number of people. Ross's Point had an ambulance in their fire department, but again, no EMTs. I taught them, I hope, a lesson in CPR. One night, I got a call from a patient at Ross's Point. He got terrible heartburn. Back then, the disease of the year, gastrointestinal reflux, wasn't, wasn't heard of. At least, uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't thought of anything uh, particularly serious. So he said, can I take some Ryopan and antacid? I said, sure. I, I, just been asleep for an hour. Those of you that know about sleep patterns, that first hour is critical, and you're sound, at least I am. And to wake me up in that first hour is a terrible tragedy on my part. But anyway, I started to go back to sleep, and I said, heartburn, midnight, I better go. So I went there. He's sitting on the edge of the bed. He's holding his chest. He's not short of breath, but he's nauseated. <coughs> He's obviously got terrible chest pain. And before I finished listening to his heart sounds, taking blood pressure, he collapsed. Put him on the floor, started CPR, told his wife to call the ambulance. Ambulance came, and I told him what to do as far as airways. We didn't have any endotracheal tube, or we didn't have a laryngoscope to put an endotracheal tube in. We did put an airway in. Did our best. Didn't have any oxygen on the ambulance back then either. Didn't save it. Uh, that was one time when I went home and said, you know, what could I have done differently? Didn't have a defibrillator. Uh, and I thought, well, did what we could, and it didn't work out. I had trouble sleeping that night. Usually I don't have trouble sleeping. Uh, that reminds me of back when I was an intern at Waterbury Hospital. I had a fellow intern called Ed Palombo. Ed Palombo was a great, big, strappy individual. Very progressive in his ways. And he decided we were going to set up a code team to treat cardiac arrest. Why I didn't carry that further, I don't know. But anyway, we set that up, and I believe that was the first code unit set up, I know, in the city of Waterbury. Uh, and we did help a number of people. Sometimes the nurses would think we were a little too aggressive, but we did our best. We also, back then, as when I started practice, there were no intensive care units. There were no coronary care units. Patients with a heart attack were put on the regular floor, so we decided hook up monitor to as many of them as we could, put the monitors in the hallway and instruct the nurses every once in a while, take a look at that monitor. I think that may have made some difference. This man also decided he had been uh, through pediatrics and watched exchange transfusions, and this was before, uh, I'm sure, dialysis. Uh, he decided that he was going to try to set up a unit whereby we could do exchange transfusions for people that came in with poisons, whether it was acetaminophen or whether it was some other. He said, you know, that's to get it out of their, get it out of their system. I didn't go along with that because I didn't really see that he could really accomplish that and uh, carry it out. I almost went into practice with him. Poor fellow, he was, let's see, back in 1960, 27, he was my age. He died at age 40, but he had bowel malignancy. 
but a very energetic, enthusiastic, excellent division. Accident calls. Uh, very often I have to go to accidents. And on a couple of occasions, uh, I did intubate patients at the site, and also they would do tracheostomy on patients that had severe head injuries. And uh, I believe the patient did all right. One time, uh, I don't know if this was necessary or not, maybe I was just exercising. There was a tractor trailer that tipped over on the way to Moore's, and I was called to the accident. The driver was pinned in the truck. I crawled in there, and they couldn't get him out. The jaws of life hadn't arrived. And the guy was sweating, short of breath, so I started an ID on him. Maybe it wasn't necessary, but uh, uh, at least I, I made an effort to try to help him. I don't know why I've written down, but yes, I do too, suicides. You know, there's so much written about why people commit suicide and what can be done to prevent it. I got called one time from a uh, patient's family in Morris, said he hung himself. So I left the office, went up, and here he is hanging from one beam. And the rope around his neck, but his feet had touched the beam below, and he was on his toes like this, still alive. So I got the ladder, went up to him, had somebody hold him, I cut the rope, let him down. I don't think I was too careful about his neck. I probably should have been more careful about his neck, making sure that his neck was stable and that he uh, didn't fracture his neck. The only thing he got out of it was burns, neck burns. And he lived, uh, we saw him several times in the office, uh, referred him once to a psychiatrist, and he didn't want to go back to a psychiatrist, so he did the best we could, and he did live to be a right old man. Uh, other times, not so successful. And it's always a question of, you know, what could have been done? And I'm sure the families feel that way, friends and family feel that way. I'm going to tell you more about some of my experiences, uh, and then I'll come back to the differences that I've found over the years. I got a call one time from family in Altona saying, when I make a house call, uh, the husband said his wife was very sick and needed attention. Would I go? I said, sure, I'll go. So I got there, and many of you know that a lot of people with the meager circumstance, start a house, finish the cellar, and that's it. They can't afford to go further, so they cap the cellar and live in the cellar for a while. Very comfortable for some. So I went down, this was, in, this was the situation. And here's this lady sitting there with her head down. And I talked with her for a while and didn't get very much out of her, damned her. And she was just depressed to the point of almost immobility. She wouldn't move. She was eating. She wasn't sleeping well, according to the husband. Uh, Frontline present antidepressants weren't available then. I did use one, one of the first uh, tricyclic antidepressants. And Went back to see her several times. Eventually she came out and uh, was able to come to the office and again lived quite a long life. Uh, I, I, you know, you can see, did I make a difference? I don't know. But <coughs> being there, somebody being there, at least paying attention, listening, showing concern, those are the things that I think are important in practice, at least in family practice. You've got to have knowledge of what the diseases are and be able to handle diseases without getting involved too much. Uh, my first OB case, that was an interesting one. Uh, it's a lady from Ross's Point. She called me and said she was in labor. So, again, no transportation. So I went to her home, examined her, and yes, yeah, she was in labor. 
So I drove her to the hospital, admitted her to the OCD hospital, admitted her to the hospital, started to write these, this balloon, <laughs> a list of orders, and you know, type and cross match. And finally, a nurse came up to me and said, You know, deliveries, pregnancies are almost all pretty natural events. You don't have to write all these orders. We know what to do. And you know something? I learned back as an intern. Listen to the nurses. The nurses will tell you what's going on and help you. If you ignore the nurses and put them down, you're in trouble. You learn from the nurses. The patient did well, delivered later on. I didn't need all those work. <laughs> Neither did the nurse, and she let me know that. <laughs> Had a patient, a uh, local person that uh, was pretty well to do, got called on uh, Christmas Eve, 1964. His wife said he was ill, fever, coughing. Went there and examined him. He was in his 70s, and so on. And he said uh, he'd been sick for a few days and clinically had pneumonia. So I took him to the hospital. I took him down myself, put him in the hospital, started an IV, started some IV antibiotics, ordered a chest x ray. Back then, the only radiologist in the physician's hospital was, and I'll use his name, Calvin doesn't want me to use too many names, so I won't use too many names. But Ira Rolson. And uh, Ira Rolson and this fellow were buddies. So I was waiting for Ira to call me back with a report of the chest x ray. So I get a call from Ira, no report. John, this patient is too sick for you to take care of. I want you to get Dean Wheeler to take care of him. <laughs> True. You know what? I did just that. <laughs> Not all my patients were always appreciative. Had a patient one time, and this was, oh, probably only about 10 years ago, a lot longer than that, probably 12, 14 years ago. She was on the third floor, adjacent to the coronary care. <coughs> she had trouble breathing. Uh, and I had ordered some inhalers for her and asked uh, one of the lung specialists to see her. And he ordered other inhalers. Next day I went in and she was in the coronary care unit. And she was intubated. And her eyes were like this, looking at me. And she couldn't talk because she was intubated. So I examined her, went out. Next day I went in, same thing. Third day I went in, tube was out. You get out of here, you horse doctor. You've tried to kill me twice already. You're not going to get another chance. You've got the reaction to one of the inhalers. So I said, sorry, and left. <laughs> I'm going to have my baseball in here now. How's that? I had a lady in town that had uh, breast cancer. And I was making house calls on her, giving her five floor uracil intravenously. Back then, that wasn't uh, too risky to do. I didn't even do any blood counts on her. Really. One night I was there, and uh, I was watching television when Hank Aaron hit his 715th home run. <laughs> that was a uh, joy. She, uh, she loved baseball, and she loved whatever the connection is. Lobsters, too. My wife's from Maine, so every time we went back to Maine, I'd always bring this lady two lobsters. And she appreciated that. And the day she died. At delivery in the office one time, uh, state police brought the lady to the back door and uh, came in and said, This lady's in uh, labor. I said, uh, You have any idea if this first, second, third, fourth, fifth baby? It's first. I said, Well, I skipped plenty of time to get to the hospital. My nurse back then was Ethel Underwood, and I don't know if you people, any of you ever knew her. Ethel was, uh, I won't call her a gentle giant because she wasn't always gentle, but she was a giant as far as a nurse was concerned. She could do anything. She was trained 
the hospital, pediatrics, emergency room before emergency room doctors, and uh, knew pretty much what people could do, what they couldn't do, and knew how to evaluate them. She said, John, you bring that patient in here, we're going to examine her, and we're not going to send her to the hospital until I'm sure that everything's all right. So we put the patient up, there's the head. So I had one other nurse that was adept at this. We did, back then, we were doing the shaving and then episiotomy after a local block. Patient delivered baby fine. Both mother and baby did fine. Uh, Changes in the office. Back then I told you we didn't do much in the line of preventive medicine. Uh, and one nurse eventually had a nurse and a receptionist. Later on, more nurses, more receptionists. And those of you that are in practice now know that the biggest hassle in practice now is not necessarily taking care of patients. It's taking care of paperwork. When I first started, Medicare obviously wasn't around. Insurances were few and far between. They never applied to anything in the office except for suturing, sometimes accident care, <coughs> Uh, later on, all these insurances started coming. So, from one nurse, one receptionist, that compounds itself very, very rapidly. And in this day and age, uh, it's, it's, well, it has to be done, no question about it. <coughs> so, from doing only pap smears, giving him immunizations. We went like everybody's supposed to do. You know, screening blood pressure, screening lipids, uh, risk factors, uh, family history, coronary artery disease, strokes, uh, colonoscopies, uh, weight reduction, osteoporosis, smoking cessation. That reminds me of another episode of when I was first in medical school. One of the first instructors that I Encountered was a man named Oscar Auerbach. Oscar Auerbach was a pathologist at the Orange County Veterans Hospital in New Jersey. He says, well, smoke, this is 1955 now. Smoking causes <coughs> bone cancer. And I don't know back then if there was any, I mean, a lot of people smoke. I smoked when I was in college for a year and a half, sorry to say. But I quit when I decided I was going into medical school and I better practice what I preach. Stress testing. We did that in the office. Uh, did more lab work. Uh, got to do flexible sigmoids. I did. The rest didn't want to do it, so I don't think they're doing it anymore, which is probably just as well. You'll leave that up to... Uh, Victor and Jean let them do their work. <laughs> uh, in, in the hospital, as I said, when I first came, no CCU, no ICU. CCUs came in 1964 when uh, Al Walker came, set it up in the, CC, in the old uh, CV unit. Al Walker, by the way, I think, was the first board of certified internist. Dean Wheeler was there, Robbins was there, Travis Robbins, Jim Reardon, but I don't believe they were board certified. Maybe Stan corrected. But he did a fine job in setting up CCU uh, ICU units were regular floors for a while and then became their own unit. Emergency room eventually got emergency room doctors, which uh, <coughs> certainly is, it, it was a great help great help to those of us in the community and to the patients, by all means to the patients. And then 
the ambulance crews began to develop with certified emergency medical technicians that can do more than we can at an emergency, than I can. I try to keep up with uh, uh, advanced courses, but these people know how to intubate, they know how to start IVs, they keep in touch with the hospital and know it, and are told what to do as far as medications. When I first came, the other specialists were surgeons, and uh, uro one, two urologists, uh, and a psychiatrist. Since then, you know, chest surgeons, vascular surgeons, uh, neurosurgeons, neurologists, dermatologists, pulmonologists, rheumatologists, and nephrologists, which are uh, really uh, a great, uh, not only great help, but just a, 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 a make up an excellent unit at CPPH. And when I first came, x-rays were limited primarily in the hospital to upper GI, very venomous, uh, gallbladder series, IVPs, and then the scans came, and more and more, which allowed physicians to do non-invasive evaluation, which very often in the past would require open surgery to find out what's going on. Some other case, I had a family in Canada called, uh, I'll use their name, I'm going to use one name, sorry Calvin, Clarks. They were a farm family across the border in Canada, and uh, they had various problems, and I used to go over, and primarily I'd go over to see them. Uh, I didn't insist they come to see me, because there was always either a cup of tea and chocolate cake or a piece of pie. <laughs> that, 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 was, uh, that was worth the trip. <laughs> Fine family, and I enjoy going over. Uh, one time I got a call from the customs immigration at, uh, I think it was in Champaign, yeah, it was in the old Champlain, I think it was the old Champlain, yeah, it was the old Champlain border. Patients passed out. We don't know what's wrong with them. So I got my had an old jeep at that time. Drove the old jeep up there. Young fellow, dead. Stripped on. And I don't know what the outcome was. Is why he had taken that and why he had uh, felt he had to poison himself. But he did. And I never got the feedback as to why what he was carrying across the border, or what he was involved with, but uh, obviously it was something that he was told to do if he got caught. I've mentioned before about one of the values of being in family practice is getting to know your patients, knowing what they, when they ask, when you ask them something and their response is such and such, you either have to probe further or you say, okay, I know this patient, I know what he's or she's telling me, and let's go on. One of the things that disturbs me about patient going to the emergency room, and I don't know why I call this a pet peeve, I shouldn't, it's really probably uh, not that significant, but patient goes to the emergency room with pain, chest pain, abdominal pain, and immediately they're asked, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you grade this pain? I'm saying you don't do that unless you know the patient. There are many patients that will never say they have a 10. And there are many patients who always have a 10. It doesn't make any difference if it's a stuffed toe or whatever. It's always a 10. So if that's a significant piece of knowledge to know, you better know the patient before you do that. The family physicians, and this is not new, have to know their limitations. They have to know when they breach the end of what they can do for a certain patient. 
That's not always easy. But it's become easier. It became easier for me as time went on when we were blessed with so many talented specialists that could help out and were willing to help out. And it made you feel more confident that you could call a patient. And I'm sure it made patients feel more confident knowing that if you, and the, you know, patients know physicians. They get to know their physicians. They get to know that they have limitations. And if, and, and very often they'll know that that, that the physician has gone beyond his capability or capability. One of the things that I learned uh, and carried out for some time uh, before Victor came on board was how to deliver biopsies. I learned that as a clinical clerk in uh, my senior year in medical school. Senior year in medical school was divided <coughs> between providing care at Metropolitan Hospital in New York City, which generally was for the very indigent and Flower and Fifth Avenue Hospital, which uh, treated mainly uh, the elite, uh, many movie actors, actresses, show people. I remember one time, uh, how many, there aren't too many, yeah, there are a few people that are almost as old as I am. Uh, Eva Gabor, was it? no, it was Magda Gabor, the oldest one came in and I had to be the admitting physician. Very charming lady, gave me no trouble whatsoever. <laughs> and so I felt, because sometimes a little old intern comes in and get out of here, I want a real doctor. So, but the differences were only outward. It's very easy to say once they're closed, oh, they all look the same. <laughs> <laughs> Pediatrics was uh, a phase of my medical school training that almost did me in. The first night I was on call, pediatrics, I inherited three children with leukemia. You know, this is back in 1959. What did we have to offer? IVs, transfusions, and here I am trying to start IVs on these poor children when it was hard to find veins and they were bleeding and I, I, I did the best I could but I went home that night and that was another night when I didn't sleep and I said I don't know whether I can do this or not. Uh, fortunately again my wife came to my rescue we were married uh, before we started medical school, and she and I lived in a uh, two and a half room apartment on East River Drive in New York City for $39 a month. We lived on $25 a week, which my parents very, very graciously gave us. Uh, but she knew what my problem was, and she said, uh, you know, and she said, and I, you know, I got, you get to, uh, you get to know your mate pretty well. <laughs> and she's got to know me pretty well, too. So anyway, she said, uh, well, it's your decision. You chose this profession. And I'll be there for you no matter what you do. And, uh, you know, something that allowed me to go to sleep. And I woke up the next day and said, well, I'll do the best I can. But uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, there are many that have gone through the same, going through medical school the same way, John, same way, right? Going through medical school and doing what you think you can, but they're so limited to what you can do. Uh, we evaluate patients now and have for some time according to SOAP, so symptoms of the patient, objective findings that you evaluate either by physical exam, laboratory, x-rays, 
whatever, and then you make an assessment as to what the condition might be, and then you plan uh, whatever you're going to do more treatment, you're going to do more evaluation, or you're going to have enough information to go on with your, with your uh, treatment. The problem with the first part, the S, is listening. Let me give you an example of one that's very difficult. Patient comes in and says, I'm dizzy. Well, do you lead that patient and say, what do you mean by dizzy? Do you mean you're off balance? Do you, no, you don't do that. You ask, what do you mean by dizzy? Well, I'm dizzy. And you keep getting that repeat. I'm dizzy. So, what do you do? You finally decide that maybe <coughs> there's a clue in there somewhere. Again, knowing your patients will tell you. Uh, objectivity is not always easy. It was never always easy for me with a patient that was suffering because I suffered with them very often. But you try not to let that, those subjective uh, feelings of your own get in the way of total care of that patient, total good care of that patient. But that wasn't always easy. I would tear when my patients didn't do well. Uh, and I don't think that's bad. I think that uh, uh, it shows, uh, and I don't mean to be self-serving about this at all, but it, it shows a care, caring person. And that's what we need in, in medicine. I had a patient one time, again, as a child, had leukemia. This was back in the 60s. Again, very little of any treatment. Sent the patient to Burlington. Came back with uh, not very much done. Patient was home. I made several house calls. And was there when the child died. Uh, it was, uh, you know, how do I say it? Tough for the, sure it was hard for the family. I felt for them, and I think, uh, I think they sense that. But, you know, it brings about a, 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 an area of coping with death and dying. We've all heard, I guess many people have heard, there's supposedly stages that we go through with death and dying. We question the diagnosis. We get angry. Uh, maybe we accept it. Maybe we don't. Or maybe we get depressed over it, which is natural. And then eventually, maybe, I don't think it always follows this pattern, although it's written, Kugler Ross, who used to write, or I, I don't think she's all right now, but wrote many articles on this. I don't really feel that it's uh, applicable to everybody. But physicians go through that too. I think. I did. And simply you say, what, you know, what did I do? Did I do enough? Could I have done more? Could I have sent the patient here or there? Should I have done this? And then you, 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 you have to say, Eventually, yes, if you have done, then you have to make peace with yourself too. Because we're all going to die, you know, that's obvious. Uh, there are things to say at the death of people, to the family, and there are many times not saying and just being there is more important. Some of my, uh, well, these may sound uh, superficial, but some of the things that are said that maybe aren't totally appropriate are God's will, time heals all. I don't know that time heals all. I wish I did. I know that it helps, but I've had many families back to my own grandfather, who have lost children. Uh, many have, ter you know, tremendous faith, and I'm a 
strong believer that faith has a lot to do with how we cope with them. Because I asked my grandfather, he lost three children before he died. The third being my father, and I said, how do you deal with this? Well, he was kind of a crusty guy. <laughs> he says, you better learn how to deal with that. Death is part of life. Life, death. And if you have faith, and he did, it will help you. It doesn't heal everything you know. But just being there, even going to somebody's wake or somebody that you know well, just being there, you don't have to say anything, really. Uh, I'm sure it's appropriate to say sincerely that you're sorry. But comments are generally best left. Uh, I'm going to skip back to some things that are a little bit more pleasant, maybe. Mm -hmm. a house call one time on a lady from Morris. Tannis, uh, Blackman's Corner, it was about 20 miles from our office. And uh, at that time, I got up from $6 to $7 on the house call. <laughs> so when I finished examining her, she could have come to the office, I knew that afterward. Uh, she asked me how much, and uh, I told her seven. She said, seven? How dare you raise your fees without telling me ahead of time? So I, I, I shouldn't have done it. But I did. I said, you know, if you go to the store and buy a loaf of bread, at that time the a and I think was in business, and the next time you go in, the loaf of bread is five cents more, have you expected the chairman of the board of A&P to call you and tell you that the price is gone up? I shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have done it. Uh, Okay, I'm getting, getting to the point that, why did I retire? Uh, I've said many times that I've gotten, and I've said it at least once tonight, that I very often got more from my patients in a day than they got from me. Uh, I had good and faithful patients who rewarded me many times over. I'm not talking about finances. I'm talking about just being there and their expression and their, what they said. And uh, as I said before, calls out after hours were rare. And as they were, they were indicated and necessary. I retired for three reasons. One, my own health, uh, which is good now. I had a heart attack 11 years ago and was fortunate enough to be able to curtail my night calls. And uh, at that time, I had two good partners that would really cover me and were willing to do it. Um, and and I, I've taken care of myself, I guess. I've done been a good patient. You know, they say doctors and nurses are not good patients. I've been a good patient. <laughs> In fact, I had a stress test today. Uh, uh, did, I guess pretty well on it. Uh, but that was one of the reasons. And the stresses in the office, some of which I've mentioned as far as paperwork and not getting the rewards of, of, uh, uh, of being able to spend more time with patients when I first started out in practice, as I told you, there was one problem patients. And there were days when I saw, I remember one day, and you'll have to pardon me, and this, is ne this again is not self-serving, but I saw 120 patients. You cannot see patients at that number and do justice to them, except sore throat, arm hurts, uh, earache, you know, hurt my finger, you know, these things were easy to take care of and I had such good help through the years that made my work so easy that uh, I was able to do it. But lately, before I retired, if we saw 
individually 25 or 30 patients a day. That was a good day. You get up to 40 and you just were, you couldn't do it. You could not do it because you couldn't do justice to evaluating as well as today's medicine requires you to do it. Was it worse back then? I suppose so. Is it better now? Yes. The other uh, reason, and uh, I've been accused of using this as my primary reason, is that I've told you right along that uh, I've had a wife that's been totally supportive of what I wanted to do. She has on occasion said to me, I remember one night, third or fourth call in the middle of the night, and I took the phone and I slammed it down. And she said to me, you realize what you did? I said, yes. She said, you know something? You've got to keep remembering, you chose this occupation. I didn't. You better learn how to behave. <laughs> I learned another lesson. But she has been so supportive and gave up her life. She could, I'm certain, done well in any accounting process, because she was very good with that. But she gave up whatever life she would, and it was totally on, uh, on her part. To take care of the home, <clears throat> take care of the children, and answer the phone. Back when, when I used to leave the office, it, before we had answering machines, I mean before we had answering service, we had an answering machine in the office. And, oh, wait a minute. No, we didn't have it. I had the office phone hooked up at home. And I had a switch there. So that when I'd leave the office, I'd call her and I'd say, Joanne, turn on the phone. And she would answer the phone. And as I told you, on Wednesday afternoon, she was a lifesaver for me. She'd let me sleep and then give me the calls. And most of the time, there were calls that certainly, in fact, all the time could have waited. Uh, and I was fortunate to leave my practice, I believe, in the hands of two excellent physicians who have carried on. Uh, George Starr joined our group in 1965, and Morris was seen in 1981. And over the years, I've had excellent, excellent staff. Nurses, front office staff, uh, I named them all at my retirement party. I'm not going to name them all now. There are some here tonight that I would love to congratulate, but I'd leave some out. I don't want to do that. Uh, but what do I miss? I miss all the things that I've talked about. I miss the people. I miss the staff. I still, when I go to the post office, my wife will say, after being in the post office or being out for an hour and a half, it, uh, and it's only a mile and a half from my home. <laughs> what took you so long? Who did you talk to? Who did you see? And I said, well, this one and that one. In fact, the last one uh, asked me a question, and Addie, our nurse practitioner now in the office, said, uh, I wish you'd stop telling patients what they should do and shouldn't do. <laughs> it's no longer your duty and it's no longer your province to do it. So I miss all that. And I miss, you know, so if I miss it so much, why? I, I'd given you the reason. And it was time. It was time. You have to make a decision. I was able to make decisions right along, never easily done. What do I do now? A lot of different things. I keep busy. Uh, some days I'll finish a day and wonder if I really did accomplish anything. And maybe not. But uh, that's pretty much my life. There are other stories, but I'll open If anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. John, you got any stories about the weather? The weather? Yeah, going out the weather. Oh yes, yes. I got stories about that Mary Jo uh, Juno would love to tell. Um, she
Katie used to go to Ellenburg with me. And we had a we had a satellite or did have a satellite clinic in Ellenburg. And it, it was always my challenge to like to hope that Tuesday afternoon when I went that it was a stormy day. <laughs> and she'd say, Why? And I said, Oh, I just love the elements. I love to challenge the elements. She, she said, the elements are much stronger than you. <laughs> but yes, uh, going up there and uh, one time, this is another story about, uh, this wasn't winter time, but this was going to Ellenburg and it was a cow out in the pasture about ready to calf. And I said she was having a hard time, so I stopped the car <laughs> and I went out, went out in the field and, and helped her deliver that calf. <laughs> Actually, when we were on the farm, I almost thought about going into veterinarian medicine. But uh, that was one time when my family, as I told you, supported as they were, were not too happy about here and now. I don't know why. But, uh, and yeah, a couple of other times, we had a terrible snowstorm one time. And uh, we were isolated. There drifts. Plows couldn't get through. Uh, I had a snow sled. And I got a call from a family that just north of where I live, up toward the border. And the fellow was having trouble breathing. So I got on my snow sled, went over several drifts, and got up there and gave me some uh, intravenous bronchodilator and uh, got him settled down. And he did okay. Coming back, I went back over the same snow drift. As I was coming down, I had my handlebars too tight. I broke the handlebars off. I'm trying to steer that snow sled back without any handlebars. <laughs> the same time, our former school nurse, Margaret Sifford Lavoie, she was, was she Margaret Sifford back then? She had a boarding home downtown. And the boarding home uh, had truck drivers. And she called me and said, you know, the truck driver here with terrible chest pain. And I think you ought to come down. And uh, I don't know what we can do. I said, you know, I don't know if any of us can come out. But again, I borrowed somebody, I borrowed my neighbor's snow sled, went down, checked him out, and it didn't seem like he was having a heart attack. I didn't have an EKG with me. I just listened to him, watched him for a while, and he settled down after he'd been there a while. Uh, yeah, those were, those were fun times. <laughs> The weather has always been that, as I said, it's always been a challenge. Uh, one time coming back from Moors, or from Ellenburg, uh, I didn't have to do it. No, or Mary Jo, I think Patty Hicks was with me at the time. And uh, somebody, I said, you know, I think I better make a house call on this person on the Cannons Corners Road. She said, it's a terrible snowstorm. If you think you have to, maybe you don't have to. <laughs> and I said, well, I, I kind of like to see him. <laughs> so I went to see him and found out he wasn't in too bad a shape. And we got stuck in the driveway and had to shovel it out, but we got all on the way. And one other, one other time, yeah, you, you remind me of all these things. I could go on, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry about this. One time I had, uh, first time I had a uh, front-wheel drive car. It was a little Honda. And it was a heavy snowstorm. And I drove into somebody's driveway, face first. And I got in the driveway fine. But do you ever try to back up a front wheel drive car against the snow, the snow drift? Can't do it. I couldn't. It just won't go. They get stuck. So I got stuck in the driveway and had to shovel it out. Uh, one other time, uh, it was again a uh, snowstorm and I got a call and my wife says, you're not going out, are you? And I said, yeah, I've just gotten a new four-wheel drive truck. It wasn't brand new, but it was new to me and I wanted to try it out. <laughs> so, so I went out and got stuck with a four-wheel drive and managed to get out. So, yeah, there were, there were times when uh, the weather was... Uh, Challenge. Yes, Last right. Two-part question, Dr. Sullivan. Yeah. 
One, are you still a good mechanic on old cars and trucks? <laughs> I knew that somebody, and I probably should have guessed it would be Brian. Um, a good mechanic knows what to do and when to do it. I don't know when to do it or what to do most of the time. <laughs> I can, I can putter, and you know I can take things apart. Pretty good about taking things apart. Yeah. But uh, not always good about putting them back together. That's why dear Mark Angel is around. I'd just like to ask you one yeah. other question too. Uh, if you could replay your life again, would you uh, stayed as a doctor or would you have been a professional athlete? <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy question because to be a professional athlete, you have to have the talent. <laughs> I never would have had the talent. I, no, I wouldn't have done anything else. No matter what the option, um, you know, you kind of you kind of hint at that, saying um, if you could hit uh, 400 and 47 home runs a year, would you uh, uh, have signed a back then what have been fifty thousand dollar contract? Um, I don't, I don't know. That would have been a tough one to figure. I don't think so. I don't think so because I was able to look far enough ahead to say it wouldn't last. Thank you. John, uh, uh, where did you first get the idea that you wanted to be a, a doctor? You know, did, did you, was there a mentor that you looked up to, or was there, when did you first get that idea? Well, I was four years old. Four years old? And do I remember that? Yes, I do. And I guess maybe uh, we remember things when we're young, when our parents keep telling us about it, I guess. But I remember driving a little pedal car. I was going to bring a picture of it, but I didn't. And I had in the back of that Dr. Allen, Dr. George Allen, who was, I think, a distant cousin to John Allen. He was our family practitioner in Champlain. There were two at the time. Um, there's Dr. Gagne and Dr. Allen and Dr. Sclair and Ross's point. But Sclair came later. But I always wanted to be Dr. Allen. In fact, I had my father print Dr. Allen as my the license plate on the back of my little pedal car. And my mother said, and she was serious. My father was a jokester. And she was serious. She, you can't be Dr. Allen. I said, why not? Because you're Southwick. I said, well, is there a possibility of changing it? Because I want to be Dr. Allen. <laughs> you know? he, I enjoyed him. He was crusty, uh, but, you know, he was there. And I remember one time when I had fever. We were running out of time? <laughs> well, whatever. I was sick, and my mother hadn't called him. And he came, he found out about it. He came up and he gave my mother uh, holy whatever for not calling him to come and check me. In fact, one time, I had a little dog, and maybe the dog was a year or so old, and we lived upstairs over my grandparents in Champlain, and the dog stayed in the cellar. The dog came up the stairs at night, turned around, fell down, broke its neck. Still alive. So I carried it up, put it in my, my wagon, with a blanket and everything, and I said to my mother, to my mother, I want you to call Dr. Allen. Oh, he won't come. It's not a, he's not a veterinarian. I said, I don't care, I want him to come and check this dog. And I insisted to the point where she did call him, and he came. He wasn't the happiest camper around, but he did come, and he soothed me by looking at the dog and just not saying anything, just looking at the dog and saying, oh, okay. And as long as he did that, I was satisfied to know that the dog was checked. But that was when I first... There were times uh, during my teenage years when I got to like the farm and thought maybe I'd like to stay on the farm. And, uh, but uh, again, my parents, as supportive as they were, kind of uh, decided that wasn't the best thing for me. And I listened. Yes, Victor. Don, you used to tell me uh, you had a special relationship with the police as you traveled back and forth. <laughs> You want me to tell that story? Yeah. <laughs> uh, one time, George will appreciate this. Uh, 
George Starr was coming back from Plattsburgh, and now he drives like 45 miles an hour in a 70 mile an hour zone. But back then he drove 70 and 45. And he caught in a speed trap, just next to Shay Z. So the arresting officer called Shay Z station and said, We got a doctor from the medical center. What should we do with him? They said, Which one is it? <laughs> and they said, It's uh, Dr. Starr. Ticket him. <laughs> so George comes back with his ticket. He says, I thought they were friends of yours. I said, George, you know this business? Because back then, there were only two doctors in the area that would go out and draw blood for blood alcohol. They didn't have breathalyzers, no emergency room physician. So Bill Adu and I would go out and uh, draw blood for blood alcohols. George Starr said, I'm not doing that. That's a waste of my time. That's not practicing medicine. I said, George, it's a necessary thing for those policemen to do. So I said, do it. Well, I said, do it, George. <laughs> he did, from then on. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do about the ticket now? I said, I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> But they were always good to me. I had one, uh, one episode with them, though. This was, uh, oh my goodness, when I was living in John Rose's house. Uh, I'd been from, I think, 7.30 in the morning until probably 9 at night. Hadn't stopped. And I was coming home, and I was going through the village of Champlain at 40 miles an hour, and 30 miles an hour zone. And I had a little Volkswagen in it. And I, I saw the police behind me. I went up, drove in my driveway, started walking the house. Hey, sir. I said, yes. Uh, you were speeding. Yes. I said, let me tell you something. There were so many minutes in this day, and if I can cut 30 seconds out of one of those minutes to get home sooner, I'm going to do it. No, you're not. <laughs> you're going to obey the law just like anybody else. <laughs> Didn't give me a ticket, but we got along fine. <laughs> yes. You brought uh, a couple of oh, yeah. there. You want to show what you brought along? Let me just—I won't open them up so much because this one's empty anyway. But this is what I used to take on house calls. And that's the original one. And in it are compartments that I had for it's uh, syringes. You know, that's another thing that's changed over the years, and that is that we've gone from sterilizing syringes to disposable, which is really the way to go. But I used to have syringes on one side. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Medicine's over here. My equipment down in there. Blood pressure cuff, stethoscope, percussion hammer, and sometimes bandages. It went from that, when I stopped making as many house calls, to what, this is a crash cart. And in it is a laryngoscope, two <coughs> tracheal tubes. Uh, today also we would have an uh, external uh, defibrillator. And this one was just to carry my blood pressure cuff, stethoscope, and some bandages. But this was the original one that I started out with. And besides, besides that one, I used to carry in the back of my little Volkswagen boxes of samples and sometimes medications that I bought wholesale. I'll tell you one other story then, now that I brought that up. House call, uh, back in the probably 65, family was sick with the flu, and it's called to examine the whole family. The mother, <coughs> father, three children, grandmother. I examined everybody, gave them medication, some of which I bought was not all samples. And when I left, I, they said, what's your fee? I said, $17. The grandmother flew into a rage. $17? No wonder you doctors all get rich. You just are pricing us out of it. 
What do you mean by charging us that much? I simply said, I'm sorry. You know, I've examined six people here, and I've spent an hour here, plus I've given you anywhere from eight to ten dollars worth of medicine. And uh, I don't think that satisfied her, but later on she became a very good patient, a very cooperative good patient. Yes? Currently, the people who go to your practice, do they still do um, house calls? I don't know. I don't know whether they do or not. Uh, I think that there are some, I think occasionally, uh, I know that with terminally ill patients that are bedridden under hospice, even though hospice cares mostly for them, uh, they may do that. But, you know, a lot of things have changed since I first started. I just mentioned hospice. What an organization that's really uh, has helped out so many people in so many ways that uh, it's just indispensable. Yes? Have you tracked uh, over your years in your career of how many babies you've brought into the world? Not that many. We would probably, see I started delivering in 1963 and delivered up until the early 70s, probably not more than uh, combined 40 a year. So probably uh, 350 or 400, not that many compared to what some people were. Yes? What, would you tell us? Uh, who the most famous athlete you've ever met and since you've been a doctor? <laughs> oh, that's easy. I should have even guessed. The best right-handed pitcher of all time, Bob Gibson. Bob Gibson. I have to tell you my baseball stories now. I said I was going to be dying to tell us okay? that. I had, I had the privilege in 1964 of going to the World Series and seeing the late third baseman for the Cardinals, Ken Boyer, hit a home run against the Mickey Mantle Yankees to help win that World Series. And then in 67, I was uh, fortunate to see the Cardinals beat the Red Sox. And then they had a cast off of the Yankees, the late Roger Maris playing right field. And that saw so him almost throw somebody out in a ground ball, right field. Almost. Well, didn't do it. And I also had the privilege of uh, seeing the acrobatic Brooks Robinson play, too. So that, uh, those were my, I never met him. But, uh, John, did you play any sports that you ever played baseball? No. <laughs> I, not like George Bush. No, senior. not like George Bush. Either one of them. Senior. Senior, yeah. First baseman, right? For the baseball. Right. No. I could uh, almost hold my own in high school with uh, only enough players to go out for each team. So other than that, when I got out to prep school, I did. I played soccer at prep school. And had a good time with that. In fact, uh, we get diverted here, but that's all right. Uh, we were playing. I was playing uh, for Shady Side Academy. We were playing in Buffalo, playing against the uh, Nickel School in Buffalo, and we were undefeated at that point. I was goalie, and the coach said to us, "If you and the defenseman get a shutout, I'll buy a state dinner." About two thirds of the way through the game, and it's snowing. It always snows in Buffalo this time of year. It snow drift in front of the goal, and somebody kicked the ball, and it lodged in the snow drift. And I landed about the same time that the ball did. But I know to this day it was a snow drift that stopped the ball. In my head. I got carried off the field. <laughs> okay. I got the I got an MVP award for that too. <laughs> But no, I, didn't, I really didn't have time in college because my, you know, I had uh, classes from 8 to noon, labs all afternoon, and uh, Saturday afternoon was the only time I had. 
and like to go watch Yale play football. They could play a little football back then and had a fair football team. Yes? John, do you have any idea about how many patients that you've um, had over the years? I know you've had our five generations in our family. Probably the sixth one. I'm not sure if my great-grandchildren got to see you. But. Trace, I had no idea. We did... Uh, First nurse, Stella Walker, what a marvelous person. She, well, all my nurses were in the workers. I, you know, I, I could go on and I could give you an hour's lecture on, or talk, not a lecture, talk about how valuable the staff was. But uh, she used to keep track of the numbers and uh, we'd add them up at the end of the month. I've got my original books back then, but over the past several years, I. I had no idea. Uh, volumes were, were high back then in the beginning, as I told you. It wasn't every day, but we could average 70 patients a day because it was a long day and it was uh, uh, just, you know, people were there to be seen. Yes, Frank. John, how did you do it? I mean, the these hours that you're talking about, the numbers of patients you're seeing, and and you always seem to be very cheerful and in a good mood. I mean, I mean, how did you do it? Really? I don't understand. <laughs> well, I told you the story about the telephone, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> now, I did you did you feel like you were overworked? No, no, no. I didn't. Uh, you know why? Because I would get up in the morning, and my farmer would be milking. Farmer David would be milking his cows. I'd come home at night, maybe 10 o'clock, particularly in the spring, in the fall, he'd be out in the field with his tractor. Those were the people that were overworked and certainly, even to this day, terribly underpaid, like nurses. But, uh, you know, I get, I get tired, but that's... I was able to sleep Short and hard, I guess, would be the way. Uh, I can actually, I don't sleep as well now as I used to, but I don't, uh, I suppose that I should go back and struggle a little bit more. I, you know, you get so much satisfaction from helping, like a teacher. You help one student, you feel like you've done a, a good day's work. You help two or three patients, you go home at night and say, maybe I did, maybe I did okay today. You don't, you know, you don't toot your horn too loudly, but you think, well, it's okay. Uh, and then the same thing would be Sunday afternoon. Sundays, uh, I may have mentioned, were a day of making house calls if I had to make them that weren't made during the week. And these were people that just couldn't get out. Uh, no transportation. And uh, might have been bedridden uh, with strokes. Uh, and, and a number of times, um, the one thing I didn't mention is that back then I, I, I had a number of patients that were poor English but undercared for, part of my fault. So in the middle of the night, I might go and congest the heart And I'd go. And back then, uh, initially a treatment choice was I need morphine. And boy, what a marvelous drug that is to clear congestive heart failure. Just was, and I think probably today it shouldn't be any different. But and then um, Lasix came along after there was another. Uh, mercury hydrin. No, not mercury hydrin. We used to use that. Mercury hydrin was there along with the with the morphine, mercury hydrin, and uh, whatever. But there was another intravenous uh, analog. Uh, Ethocrinic acid. You know, I, that's that's why I didn't go into internal medicine. There's so many brighter minds out there. That, uh, but you know, that stuff you have to reconstitute. In a big, it came in a big, as I remember initially, a big vial, and you had to reconstitute it. And it was still a big volume to shoot into somebody, but it worked. Uh, but I'd sit there, and you know, it was. Is the word enlightening, but it was satisfying to see a patient really respond to something that you did. 
And you didn't, as I said, you didn't go home with your arm behind your back. You didn't start patting yourself on the back because you say, well, you know, I may have done, like the old story, has done more harm if I didn't stay around long enough to make sure the rhythm was as best as I could detect it to be okay. Uh, but then I, I was able to sleep. Uh, and very rarely, even when I got up at night, I would be sound asleep almost by the time I got back to bed. I was able to sleep that way. And that Wednesday afternoon was like having to just gone for two hours or three hours sometimes. Sunday afternoon sometimes, the same. Uh, yeah, I go back and do the same thing. Right? I still have to struggle with that fifty thousand dollar bonus back then. I think that I've been going for this. How many old cars do you have to, Dr. Self? Oh, yeah. <laughs> working working old cars? Total. Hundred? No, forty-five. Forty-five? Yeah, well, I knew you were gonna ask. I knew it'd be you that would ask. <laughs> but they don't all work. There are about uh, fifteen of them that are in good order and the rest of them need more work than I'll ever be able to accomplish, I'm sure. John, do you have the battery fixed on that motorhome? Yes, it wasn't the battery. It wasn't the battery. Just the cables. <laughs> <laughs> cables, that's dear Mark Angel. You know, Mark is a, he's a marvel. And he doesn't care. My wife will say, why do you take that poor mechanic who's got other things to do, the worst pieces of junk to work on? I said, he never rejects. He never says no. He says he won't say no to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, yeah, with the cables on it, now I've got a fuel pumps going on it, so I got to see the fuel pumps. Did you buy a pig in a poster? No, no, I've had enough fun with that to get my money back on it. <laughs> yes? Dr. John, even with all your busy schedule and stuff, you always seem to find time to play with street hockey with us and uh, come down to the cemetery pond and check the ice and skate with us. That's right. Yep. Never could skate very well either, but we tried anyway. We tried. Have yeah. you ever considered writing a book, Dr. I've kept a journal for the last 25 years. Uh, of everyday events. Some days my wife, and she's not supposed to read it, but she does. <laughs> <laughs> I don't put anything in there that she shouldn't read. <laughs> but anyway, she says, you know, you made quite an entry today you told about the weather. <laughs> but I said, well, that was all that was important today was the weather. Well, thank you all very much.